What's up everyone, welcome to today's video, welcome to the Video Game Fight School channel, thank you very much for tuning in. So apparently, Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is going to be running at 60 FPS on consoles. I think this is a huge feat, but I wanted to go ahead and talk about some nuances with regard to how the game is able to achieve it with a big large open world, whereas we're hearing rumors that Dragon's Dogma 2 is going to be running at 30 FPS, and we're also possibly hearing the same rumors surround a game like GTA 6. Because if we don't make the distinction as to how the technologies are working, there are going to be a lot of misconceptions out there that put developers in a really strange light. So let's go ahead and talk about it. Because just recently, um, you know, we, uh, we've we been looking at the game. We even got to play a little bit of the pre-alpha or whatever it is or the alpha test for Suicide Squad. Uh, on PC, my performance was not necessarily affected, but I do use some uh, hardware that is not necessarily, you know, uh, in terms of the average hardware that a lot of people are using. I do video production and I dabble into game development as a hobby. So my hardware is not necessarily something I want to say is, you know, is representative of what a lot of people use. But for the most part, we didn't hear of anybody complaining, even when they released the NDA, talking about how performance was a problem. Now, how are the developers at Rocksteady able to achieve this? Well, I think, and this is a hypothesis because I have not seen the code for their game. It would be nice, though. I mean, but, you know, that's proprietary stuff nonetheless. But we know other games that do work like that. One of them is Tom Clancy's The Division 1 and The Division 2. The Division 1 is capable of doing this. They have their first game unlocked on the PlayStation 5 and, uh, well, no, their first game unlocked to 60 FPS on the Xbox Series X. Sorry, there is no 60 FPS unlock on the PS5 for the first game. The second game, however, has a 60 FPS, uh, you know, uh, capability and you're able to play the game at 60 FPS. Uh, that's the Division 2. So this is the Division 2 running on the PlayStation 5 and it's running at 60 FPS. Beautiful, smooth. You don't experience any FPS drops at all that I know of, except maybe you're having server issues. It is a live service game. That is why I'm actually bringing it to light here in this conversation, because I wanted to use it as, in my opinion, a marker or these two games anyways, as a marker to explain how Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League is able to achieve it. These games are live service games that require an online connection, meaning that at some point the developers are running a portion of the game on a server somewhere, a much more powerful device or set of powerful devices that get to connect players, maintain a capacity of players that can actually run the game on those servers to allow for performance to be the best that it can be. This is how I think that they're achieving it. In fact, if you even wanted to go deeper and say, okay, what a developer saying about this, I can show you a developer who worked on the Division 1 and the Division 2 who mentioned something briefly about this when another conversation about another live service game was circulating around the internet. So about the same time, uh, just a few years ago, when Outriders came out, it was an online only game and there were a lot of conversations around it. And Frederick Thailander, who is actually a developer at Ubisoft Massive, worked on the Division 1, the Division 2, and even worked at EA back in the day. He put himself in a conversation and was trying to explain the technical size of things. Young Ye at the time asked this question and said, out of genuine curiosity, what is the logic behind a game like Outriders being built in such a way that even its single player components requires online. Why choose to construct a game that way when it could potentially be restrictive for players? So Frederick says, I didn't make Outriders, of course, so I can only speak for the pretty similar game that I did help make, The Division. You do it because you can run more. The 2013 laptop CPU that is in an Xbox One or PS4 isn't too capable. So you run heavy things like ray casting and AI on a server. So. The Suicide Squad game, in my opinion, is more than likely taking this approach. Now, I'm not certain exactly what is being run on their servers, but it makes sense that rendering an open world like that and making it run at 60 FPS on the Series X and the PS5 is more than likely sharing the, the task with regard to running different things on the game. And because the way the game is actually structured, where you have a lot of AI characters all over the place, it's not far to say, okay, possibly the AI of this game is being run on a server. Now, I also have to applaud, you know, Rocksteady because it's an Unreal Engine game as well. 
And, you know, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to pull off with Unreal Engine, but it is still the fact that this is the limitation that they had to face in order for them to be able to get the game to run locally. Now, I made this video because there are also the people who are looking and saying, well, this whole online thing I'm not necessarily so fond of. Well, the developers are working on an offline version of the game, which they say will come at a later date. Now, we don't have any date nor timeline, and I'm hoping that they actually bring it so that we actually have a tangible version of the game. So in the case or in the event that the live service game shuts down, we can still play as these characters. We can still have their cutscenes, and, you know, still be able to go back and play some aspects of the game if we actually did want to. However, the biggest challenge that they're going to face for that is actually getting that version of the game to run like what they claim this version of the game is going to run at, which is 60 FPS. And the reason I say claim is because at the time of making this video, the game has not been released. So that's where I think it's going to be interesting. And that's where it makes me somewhat a little uh, fickle in thinking or, you know, trusting that they're going to be able to pull this off. But it's not impossible. Don't get me wrong. Even though many of these developers have said that, OK, the biggest challenge so that we can do more, it's not impossible to make the offline version. It's just that it will mean a significant restructure of the game with regard to how they stream levels, how they stream areas, how they stream structures, the level of detail and just doing a lot of alchemy to be able to render the world to give you that 60 FPS, uh, you know, presentation or that 60 FPS performance when the game releases. So I hope this has answered a little bit of the questions that people might have. This is a, you know, in my opinion, a reality that has faced a lot of games. For those of you who may also be wondering, a game like Gotham Knights is not a live service game and it was a game, even though it had, say, multiplayer as well, it did not use the online methodology to run things. You could play the game offline. You could download it. All of the AI, all of the different aspects will load, will run on your machine. And so I think one of the reasons that game was at 30 FPS on consoles was because the console CPUs just could not maintain running all of these different aspects of the game at the same time. At the, at the time the game launched, if you said that, a lot of people called you crazy. They called you a shield. They compared to other games like Spider-Man, which is a single player game. And a lot of its assets and its meshes are not necessarily as detailed. Even the PC version of the Spider-Man game is way better. That's the Spider-Man remastered game is better than the PS5 version. When Digital Foundry did their analysis, they concluded that. So there's just so much in the technical side that I strongly believe that, you know, as gamers, especially now that the consoles are touting, you know, uh, PC similar hardware need to start paying attention to because this is what it means when you say you're going to, you know, play on the same, you know, uh, field as what PC hardware is capable of doing, then you need to get into pretty much learning and knowing how it works as best as you possibly can to be able to help you make better decisions at the end of the day. So thanks for watching the video. Appreciate you guys' time and audience. Let me hear your thoughts in the comment section, and hopefully we'll talk pretty soon in another one. Peace out.